So let's get started. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we have been doing and the general field of dependability. And specifically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how dependability and data analytics come together in order to build dependable systems. And uh, this is our, the website for our group, the Dependable Computing Systems Lab. And this presentation is available from that website if you go to the presentations uh, section of it. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about the basics of dependability. What are the broad research directions that people are uh, pursuing in this field of dependable computing? And then I'm going to do uh, a quick overview of how dependability and data analytics come together in two different domains. So one of these domains is embedded wireless networks, embedded mobile networks, and the other domain is computational genomics. So I'll talk a little bit about what are the, the community, the research directions uh, that are going on, which brings together dependability and data analytics, and give you a teaser of a result or two from our group. And then uh, depend, I'm going to do a deep dive into some work on dependability in cellular network and dependability in uh, IoT systems. So what is dependable computing? Very simply put, it is the property that your system is going to be able to provide the functionality that it is designed and developed for. And it should be able to provide this functionality within the correct time bounds. And it needs to be able to provide this functionality despite the occurrence of two different kinds of faults. It needs to be able to provide this despite the occurrence of unintentional or naturally occurring faults, your software bugs, or your hardware race conditions. And it needs to be able to do this despite the occurrence of maliciously induced faults. So these are attacks which are injected into your system either from external, outside the periphery of your system, or insider attacks. And in terms of terminology, there is some confusion in here. So I thought, uh, I'll spend a minute or two. The, what you start off from is a fault. So this is, this is the root cause of the problem. So you have a fault in your system. When that fault gets exercised, let's say the buggy piece of code gets executed, then that fault becomes an error. And when that error really leads to a deviation from the correct specification, so something that is visible to the end user, that's when that error becomes a failure. So some faults become errors, some errors become failures. So as a designer of a computing system, what you do is you try to build in the right kinds of dependability techniques at different levels of the stack. So this is looking at a single node. In a distributed system, you're going to have many nodes like this, which are connected via some networking protocol. So within that node, you're going to have some techniques which go into the hardware. For example, if you buy uh, any decent laptop today, you are going to have hardware memory, which is protected by various kinds of error uh, detection and error correction codes. Uh, moving up, you're going to have operating system software. For example, it's going to provide you with isolation from uh, across processes. So process one cannot write into the memory space of process two. Moving up, you're going to have a reliable communications layer, which is going to do things like CRC on messages. So if your message gets corrupted, the receiving end can know that there is a corruption in the message. And then you're going to have middleware, like uh, Java middleware. Uh, and then finally, you're going to have some techniques at the application level. So as a designer of the system, what's key upon you is to decide which technique do you put in which layer of the stack. And there are dependencies among these techniques. So for example, if at the operating system level, you're already providing you with isolation of processes, then at the higher level application, you don't need to worry about somebody else's process running in the same machine overwriting your process. So depending on what gets put where, other layers can assume that from the different layers of the system. So like in the rest of computer system design, abstraction is key uh, to this concept of dependability. The next piece is saying that your failure is not my failure. In other words, there are different kinds of failures that systems have to deal with. 
So in this concentric circle, you can think of this being the most constrained set of failures. Most constrained as in, they're also easier to detect, easier to deal with. And as you move outside in this concentric circle, you get more and more unconstrained set of failures. So the most constrained would be what are called crash failures. So when your system or component fails, it stays silent. It does not respond to any queries. It just stays silent. So that's the crash failure. Then you would have something called an omission failure, whereby you ask a question of the service, you send it a query. Sometimes it omits to respond to your query. So that would be an omission failure. Then you can also have a timing thing where your system responds and responds with the correct answer, but it just takes much longer than it should under the correct specification. And finally, you have a Byzantine or malicious failure. So this is the most unconstrained kind of failure where any particular component can behave in an arbitrary manner. It can sometimes give you the right answer, sometimes give you the wrong answer, and give you different wrong answers at different times. And multiple components can collude amongst itself in order to give you wrong answers. So in dependability, you have to ask the question, what kind of fault am I trying to deal with? So there are three most important things in dependability. I was taught this when I started in grad school, and I think it's still true. So the first thing is redundancy. The second thing is redundancy, and the third thing is also redundancy. It just means you have to deal with lots of redundant components in order to ensure dependability. But I thought life is very easy. As long as I figure this out, I'm done. But it turns out it's pretty hard to figure out how exactly to handle redundancy. So you have to ask pesky little questions like, how much redundancy is good enough? Uh, where do I put the redundancy? So if you think of that system software stack, where do I put the redundancy? And if you think about multiple nodes, how much redundancy do I put in my overall distributed system? For every piece of data, do I need to make three copies, or is two copies enough? And then how do you validate the redundant operation? How do I make sure that once I have these three redundant copies, that these copies are being kept in sync as new writes are happening? So this is the means of achieving dependability is this, uh, is this simple multi-stage process. So you try to prevent problems before they occur. But when you cannot, you try to detect an error as soon as it happens, before it becomes a user-visible failure. Once you detect, you parallelly try to contain it so that this infection does not spread to other components in your system. And parallelly, you try to diagnose or localize. You try to understand which is the component which is causing this problem. And finally, you try to automatically repair it, so to get this component back into an operational state. So as long as you can do this, you can have a dependable system. So that's all that I have in terms of the basics. Are there any questions, thoughts at this point? All right, I hear that there is a five to six question minimum before you're allowed to leave this room. If that's an urban legend, tell me, but otherwise I think the doors are going to be locked if we have five or six questions. All right, so any questions at this point? Yes, go ahead. So the question is, cyber resilience and dependability, are they the same? So there is some terminology confusion in this space. Dependability is considered the overarching terminology that, that includes aspects of resilience, security, and so on. So resilience typically is considered as the resilience to naturally occurring errors. All right. So uh, now we're going to get into two domains where we see dependability and data analytics really coming together to come up with some important developments. So embedded and mobile networks. So these are networks of various kinds of things. And these things are smart. They are connected. They have computational power. They have sensing power in them. And they are deployed all over the place. So they're not deployed only in, in sanitized data centers, but they're deployed in our physical spaces around us. So you want to build systems which are dependable uh, and are made of things like this. So there are certain fundamental challenges in ensuring the dependability of such systems. The first challenge is that they're very resource constrained. 
And there are two resource, well, maybe two, two fundamental resource constraints that have stayed with us for a long time. The first one is the bandwidth. So these kinds of devices, you cannot come up with a protocol that is going to communicate a lot because bandwidth is a precious resource. The other constraint is that they are often run on battery, and therefore you want to make sure that in all this communication, you're not draining out the battery purely for achieving dependability. And then from a security perspective, these are two important constraints. The first is that these are going to be untrusted. So people can physically walk up to these nodes, can tamper with the nodes, reprogram them, reflash them. And you cannot assume that you're always going to be able to connect to a trusted central repository, a trusted central server. So you have to be able to achieve dependability in the presence of disconnected operations. And they have low-end microcontrollers and lightweight operating systems, if at all, which don't have any of the standard security protection. So that's the terrain we're operating in, in embedded and mobile networks. So the opportunity, so those were the challenges. There are also certain opportunities that this domain provides to us. So the first opportunity is that these have fewer modes of interactions with the users. They're, therefore, they do not have to deal with absolutely a gigazillion of different ways in which the user can interact with these devices. The second one is they're oftentimes unimodal. They're meant to do one thing. They're meant to sense the temperature in here. They're meant to set up what the temperature control is going to be here. So they're meant to do one or a few very definite things. And finally, there is a certain density, density of deployment. So if one device goes bad, maybe there are other devices around in that region which can take over the role of that, that uh, device. Now, there are some active research directions which are being uh, pursued in here. So the first is, how do I do distributed monitoring of these devices? So I want to know if something bad is happening. I want to know if a node is malfunctioning, if a node has been compromised. So I want to be able to monitor the behavior of these devices. And because these are in disconnected modes of operations and geographically spread out, I cannot have a single uh, entity which is monitoring it all the time. And then there can be cellular radio access problems. So there are several faculty right here in EC who are working on this. The radio spectrum is quite limited. So how do you deal with the, the congestion that happens because of the limited spectrum? And then the third piece is record and replay for problem diagnosis. So as the nodes are deployed out there in the field, I want to record at a very fine granularity what's going on. So that if something bad happens, I can bring all the traces back into the lab and replay it to figure out what went wrong. So this is like a debugger that you have. But now, this is a debugger which can operate on these embedded nodes and at a large and at a remote uh, scale. So one significant result that we've had in this space is uh, we have uh, created the software stack called TARDIS, which allows for software-only record and replay of embedded applications. So the basic idea of record and replay is what I just said. It's a very, very powerful primitive that is used for debugging distributed systems. Because I have a faithful record, like a black box on an aircraft, of what exactly went on. So if there is a failure, I can go through that black box and in an automated manner figure out, is it because there was too much network communication here? Is it because this cryptography API that failed? What exactly went wrong? So. The challenge, of course, is if you record all the things that are important, then you're going to run out of space. And importantly, also, you're going to run out of the processing time uh, on these devices. So what we have come up with is uh, a very targeted, optimized stack, which will record all the sources of non-determinism and compresses them in a domain-specific manner. So for example, if you did not do anything, uh, you, would, you would fill out the flash on on uh, one of these devices, like the Amazon Echo Dot, in, uh, in an hour. So with the high level of compression that we can do, we can uh, have a reduction of 88% in terms of the log row. So why do I need record and replay? Because I want these devices to be used in somewhat critical applications. Well, it's important for me to know if something bad has happened, if there is a bug, or if there is an attack in these kinds of systems. So this is a pretty picture, but what I want you to take out of this picture is, so these are uh, radio states. 
So the radio that's on these devices, which is communicating, that goes through multiple state transitions. So these are three different state variables in that radio. And this points to a, a long-standing bug that was there in this low-end radio, where it was making state transitions very, very often. If you make state transitions too often on these devices, you end up wasting a lot of energy. And that's what was happening in here. By sticking in a fine-grained monitoring tool like ours, we are able to create this kind of a visualization and then create, uh, and this basically is a whole bunch of uh, black and white transitions in here, uh, spaced very, very closely together. So we are able to figure out that there's something that was uh, going wrong in here. So this basically has given to a whole community building diagnosis protocols that in hardware as well as software for these low-end IoT devices. So in terms of data analytics and dependability coming together, the current state of practice is very, very limited. And what is needed in terms of the level of sophistication for data analysis here is quite simple. And some examples of promising convergence of the two is you could, for example, figure out what kind of interaction happens between two devices. And then if it deviates from the pattern that you have learned, maybe two devices are always communicating at a fixed uh, rate. So if it deviates from that, this could be used for anomaly detection. Or if, you, if, you're, if it's sensing certain values in a region or in a time period, you could use that pattern in order to compress the stream in a very, very domain-specific manner. Because space and the computational power is at a premium on these devices. So that's all that I have to say in terms of the embedded and mobile networks, this convergence of dependability and data analytics. Are there any thoughts, questions? Yes? Okay, thanks. I was just wondering, when you have the system that's collecting this recorded data, does that introduce another potential fault where somebody could maliciously go in and say that somehow change your data collection where it thinks that your system's broken when it's actually good, and then how do you mitigate that? Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. So in all of these systems, the term that you ask is TCP. If you want to appear very wise, you say, what is the TCP in your system? What it stands for is trusted computing base. So anything that you de design, there has to be that key part that you trust, that this is invalid. Nobody can mess with this. So the smaller your TCP is, the better it is. So in the case of record and replay, the software that is recording and the flash part where you're, where you're actually storing that, those are part of the CCP of the overall system. Any other question? Yes? So I want to know when we talk about data analytics, are we talking only about like, pattern recognition or something like that? But we didn't use any real data, I mean, any data set or something to find this anomaly this year. So this is all based on real data. So when I say data analytics, you will deploy the system out there in the field, and in a sort of training period, you're going to collect a lot of data. And you have to have some confidence that during the training period, your data is clean. That means this part, there was no attack or no fault. And then you use that data, you apply some machine learning algorithms to come up with a pattern, like a classifier for that, based on that kind of data. All right, so I'm moving into computational genomics. I know this is a very robust area of research here, uh, here at Virginia Tech. So in computational genomics, uh, the, the big challenge has been this phenomenal growth in the amount of genomic and epigenomic data. Because now the, the process of collecting this kind of data has become democratized. So everybody, every lab worth its salt has these kinds of uh, sequencers which are available to them. However, these sequencers are quite still error prone. So for example, when you read certain sequence data, every one in, in, in 100 bases you may have, it is missed or it is inverted or some extraneous bases are injected. So there are reads, there are technological constraints which cause these to have certain amount of errors. And different kinds of fairly sophisticated algorithms have been devised in order to be able to correct for these kinds of errors. So the biggest dependability challenge here is any algorithmic technique you come up with has to be able to operate at very large scales. 
Okay? So the one human being's genome would be just in an ideal world would take you 700 megabytes. So now you can imagine that as we are going into this era of personalized medicine and individualized healthcare, everybody's genome is going to be stored, sequenced, and stored. You really have need to have your algorithms work at a very large scale in terms of the data. The second one is that the the code bases tend to be rather fragile, and um, if there are bioinformaticians in here, they may throw. Uh, eggs or tomatoes or whatever it is at me if I say fragile code bases. But that's just a fact that we have found that in terms of being able to operate on newer kinds of computational platforms or slightly different data formats, these code bases are very fragile. And there is lack of efficient cyber infrastructure which are focused for running these kinds of work. So those are big dependability challenges. Certain opportunities that we've seen here are there are emerging standardized building blocks. So you could put together these building blocks and create applications out of them. Some parts of these algorithms are embarrassingly parallel, so you can easily scale them up. And there are good metrics which have been developed by the community for judging the accuracy of uh, and error resilience of these algorithms. So some active research directions we have that are there in this, in this space are error corrections, um, applying certain techniques for distributing these workloads onto large numbers of clusters, and some standardized workflows and testing. So you have a particular use case, you put them in the standardized workflow language, there is a parser which takes the standardized workflow and then runs it on a backend. And you as an end user don't have to deal with all the subtleties of using this kind of a cyber infrastructure. So one sample result that we have in this space is by looking at a lot of these applications, we have this insight that there are certain building blocks which keep recurring in these different applications. So this is an example of a local sequence alignment. So you have a genomic sequence A, genomic sequence B. You want to align them, and you want to figure out what is the best alignment. This is an example of an application which does genome-wide uh, sequence alignment. And this is an example of something which does genomic assembly. So the specifics of these applications are not important. The takeaway is that there are certain software building blocks that recur among multiple applications. So if you could, if you as a computer scientist or as a computer engineer go in and develop very customized and very efficient building blocks for this, the bioinformatician or the genomics researcher can put these together, sort of like putting the pieces of a Lego block together, and relatively easily create these highly efficient, scalable uh, applications. So we have developed something like this along with all the compiler infrastructure for it, and that's presented in our ICS paper from last year, and the BCD paper from this year. And this is the typical bragging slide which says that the vanilla application is slow, we are really fast, nobody ever shows this bar going below, and we will not show that either. Uh, and this happens because our compiler is able to put in all these kinds of domain-specific optimizations to make this run faster on standard hardware. This is not some esoteric hardware. Okay, so uh, coming to this piece about what is the current state of practice of applying data analytics, this is fairly primitive. Um, there isn't much use of uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms uh, in here, but I think the level of sophistication that is needed is fairly high. But those algorithms themselves need to be scalable uh, because of that fundamental uh, requirement I said for uh, scalability. Uh, in terms of promising convergence of dependability and data analytics, one uh, area where we are seeing some work is uh, you want to come up with the patterns of errors that are made by the sequencing instruments, and the error correction that you do is customized for the patterns that you learn. Another important one is load balancing is a fundamental algorithmic thing that has been around for quite a while. So anytime you use a data center, there is a load balancer at the front end of the data center, which balances the load across multiple requests. It turns out load balancing in these kinds of workloads is quite hard, because it's difficult to predict how long a particular bioinformatics task is going to take. 
and there is uh, by learning the you can use using data analytics you can learn these kinds of patterns. If your incoming workload has this pattern, then this is how long it's going to take. So there is some um, very exciting developments on that front. So that's all that I have to say about the computational genomics, the challenges, and current results. Any questions, thoughts? All right, so then I have a bit of a deep dive now into two areas, the dependability in a cellular network, and you can find all the gory details in these three papers of ours, which are all available from our uh, group homepage, except this last one, it just got accepted. But here we're talking about dependability in the cellular network. So the motivation here is that uh, the current state is that the cellular devices consider the network to be a down pipe. It's a pipe which is only responsible for providing connectivity, for getting data in and getting data out. And the devices can only react after the connectivity is degraded. So you're going through a tunnel in Boston and you realize that there is no more cellular connectivity. The device only gets to know of it after this has happened. And then it, it basically loses the connection or um, loses the phone call, and there is nothing that you can do about it. And conversely, the network looks upon these devices as a black box. So the device does something, it sends some traffic out, it gets some traffic in, but the network doesn't really know about the nature of this traffic, uh, it has no predictive ability. So the fundamental thesis here is that if you, if the device and the network could cooperate, could share certain information, you could proactively handle failures before they become failures. So the, and that's the fundamental thesis that we have developed in terms of um, two, one framework that we've developed called Tango, which enables real-time cooperation between the device and the cellular network. And you can build many different kinds of services on top of a framework like this. So the service provides real-time data analysis to alert the device of certain events. Maybe the device is moving into a region where the network is highly congested, so then the network can inform the device that this, there is this kind of an event that's going to happen. And then the device or the application running on the device can decide how to react to this kind of an alert. So for example, it can decide to pre-cache some of this content. So here's a high level schematic of this. So you have the mobile device. It has certain user data. Uh, then you have certain network data, which is available from the cellular network. So the cellular network itself, you can think of it in terms of a core network and an edge network, okay? So um, the, the device-specific data and the network data all comes into our data analysis module, which is logically centralized, but physically this is distributed in this fog layer of the cellular network. So this itself is not just running on one machine. So then it creates a set of offline models, models for how the device is interacting with the network. So these models can be arranged according to device type, it, uh, for example, the, the, an Android device will have a different model than an iOS device. And even within iOS, we found the different versions have different models that are customized, that need to be customized for them. They're arranged according to network type. If you're in a 4G environment versus a 5G environment, different models. And they may even be arranged according to traffic type. For example, if it's a highly interactive traffic versus a batch mode traffic. So offline, these kinds of models are built. And online, what happens is that the user data from the device gets into our data analysis component in here, which selects which model to use. And then using the selected model, it predicts what's going to happen. It predicts if there is going to be a failure even down the pipe. And then it sends that even notification to the device, and then the device can react appropriately. So that's the 30,000 feet view of how this device network cooperation can work. Is that clear? Question? Okay. So how the network will be providing feedback to? How the network will be providing feedback to? No one's thinking about so what happens is that we collect, we get the streaming uh, real-time data, which already AT&T is collecting, or any cellular provider, I should 
be careful of what I say because I'm supposed to be recorded and this is going to be on YouTube. But take any cellular provider. Any cellular provider is collecting all of this data in real time. And what this does is it feeds that data. Things like what is the uplink rate, what is the downlink rate, how many um, how many handoffs happen from one base station to another. All of that data gets into our data analysis component, which can now predict what's going to happen. Question? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if the data analysis component introduces any kind of lag or delay. Yeah, so that's a good question. Does the data analysis, here we are operating under very tight time constraints. If you're going to go into a network congested region, you may have 30 seconds before uh, you go into that region to predict this. So the time delay that the data analysis component introduces needs to be very, very small. And therefore, we always favor the simpler machine learning models here than the more complex ones. And that's how, in the end, we find the delay is not a factor. Okay, so one, one example is the mobile streaming application. Everybody these days consumes streaming data, streaming audio data, streaming video data. So can you use, can you build an application for that on top of a framework like Camry? And this is exactly what we have done. So what happens today is that when there is connectivity degradation, then this results in a disruption to the stream. This is the current state of practice. Now, um, Latest uh, standards like MPEG-4 or Dash, MPEG-4 Dash, what they do is they try to buffer content, okay? So they have a certain amount of buffer so that in case there is a degradation in connectivity, you can play the buffer. But what you ideally want is that when the connectivity is good, then your buffer can be quite small, okay? But when your connectivity is going to be bad, that's when you, that's when you want to buffer, pre-buffer content that you may use. And it's only when you have a predictive capability when you know which of these two situations you are in. So what's key is this ability to predict based on data that you're seeing where you're going to fall. And that's exactly what we have done. Uh, so it increases the buffer size and or reduces the bit rate. That's the other control parameter that you have. The bit rate at which you consume your stream can also be varied. So it's called variable bit rate. So um, this is again the schematic which falls in with our offline training that's done. And then at online, you get all these network conditions. And based on that, you're able to predict what the condition is going to be in the next 10 seconds, next 20 seconds, next 30 seconds. And you can adjust the buffer rate based on that. So this involves uh, two kinds of prediction. One prediction is the monitoring of the network load, which we discussed. The other kind of prediction is the user's mobility. Where is the user going to move to? Because I'm interested in the kind of network condition and where the user is going to move to. So which of these two is harder? Predicting your mobility. Are you, are you predictable where you move to from one place to another? Or is it harder predicting the congestion characteristic in the network? How many of you think predicting your mobility is harder? Minuscule minority. If my hunch is correct, I know what the answer is going to be. How many of you think monitoring the network load is harder? So my hunch is correct. I knew that the vast majority is not going to care or is already asleep. And uh, the response here is indeed true. So it turns out that the user location monitoring is relatively easy as long as you're monitoring at the granularity of a base station. So you're tracking that this node is connected to base station one, then base station two, then next it's going to move to base station three, okay? Now, um, and especially we do the study on, campus, on, on Purdue campus, and there it's especially easy because you have classes which follow a certain regular pattern. So students come out of class one, then they go to class two, and, and, and similarly. So this one turns out to be relatively easy. So we can get away with fairly simple machine learning algorithm. This one turns out to be quite a bit harder, which, which surprised us that the network congestion characteristics tend to be quite dynamic. 
Okay, so I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides in here. Take it from us that Tango with perfect location prediction is the best. So in terms of as you increase the number of audio streaming users, how much pause time do you see? The lower is better. You don't want, as you're consuming the stream, for it to pause and buffer in between. So lower is better. And of course, our technique, but with perfect location prediction, turns out to be the best of all techniques. And this uh, dash is what is the current standard. OK, so then we ask the question, so this is about streaming content. What about the application itself? Okay. So that's where this word called app streamer comes into play. So here's the motivation behind it. So if you look at how many apps you have installed on your phone, then it has been found that the rate at which people are installing apps on their phones is growing much faster than the rate at which the, the storage capacity of these phones is growing. So people are having to delete apps uh, in order to make space for the newest apps, or they're having to delete content in order to have, uh, make space for the newer apps. And some of the popular uh, games are pretty heavy duty in terms of their storage capacity. One to four gigabytes is what we found. So the current practice is you either download a game in its entirety, or an app in its entirety, or you don't download it at all. Right? But the question that, that we asked is just like you have streaming content, why can't you have streaming application itself? In other words, you download only the real basic part of the application that you need to get started. And then as you are playing the game or as you're using the application, predicting what you are going to consume, you can download the relevant parts. And I included this because it works. So uh, of course, uh, this is, there is a feasibility uh, existence proof for this. So currently, the, the, the other approach that you can take is running the application on the, uh, on the cloud and streaming only the video to your client. So this is called the thin client approach. This is the other possibility. Um, and the other possibility is you store this application purely on the cloud, but this turns out to have an unac unacceptable amount of delay, even with very good uh, connectivity. So in order to make our uh, approach work, the predictive application streaming, there are two basic things that you have to do. You have to collect data about the file accesses that are being made by multiple users. And then you have to build a model that predicts what the future accesses are going to be based on recent behavior. So here's the schematic for it. You collect all of this trace data. Um, here's some details which turns out to be very, very important. That if you, if you track this data at a very, very fine granularity, every block that's being accessed, then this model becomes too complicated. Remember, you also have to do this prediction at real time. As you are playing the game, heaven forbid that you have to stall while playing the game. You have to be able to get in the content that you need before you're going to use it. So this is going to be very, very fast. So this detail is you basically do some kind of aggregation to create super blocks. And then you create what's called a continuous time Markov chain model. So this is an impressive sounding term. But all that it means is, it follows the Markovian property, and it has a time component to it. Meaning you can ask, ask this one, what is the probability that I'm going to access block B5 in the next five seconds? And this will give you an answer to that. So now with runtime, as the user is interacting with this application, what we do is we capture the real-time file accesses, fit it, uh, query the CTMC model. The CTMC model says what are the predicted blocks, and then we have a block fetcher, which in a background task gets in all the relevant blocks. Okay? And so the end result is this. Lots of details in there, I'm skipping through. Okay, so maybe after this talk is over, you can download this and play this video game. But only if you are into first-person shooter games, which I was not. So I had my graduate students run this experiment, and I was very happy for that. Uh, it's a pretty heavy-duty game, one point uh, more than a game gigabytes. Um, 
So we had uh, users come in and play this game for 20 to 30 minutes. There are some people who are very good, so we could finish two levels in 20 minutes, and some people like me, my data was not usable because I could never finish even level one. I kept getting killed in this first person, first person shooter game. The people who were not so good took the whole 30 minutes. And then they fill a questionnaire to report the user experience, like did they see stalls as they were interacting with the game as well. So uh, the skill level, we had beginner, intermediate, and expert. And in terms of the overall user experience, no difference was said by 70%. So between when you had all the application installed on your device versus using our uh, kind of framework, about 30% said that there was marginal, marginally worse. And the marginally worse, the most important uh, contributory factor there was the loading time took longer, so in the beginning. And in terms of the stalls, there were uh, about 30% said that uh, there were some slight delays with our app streamer uh, versus the banana But here's the kicker. So if you look at the amount of storage space that is being used, it's more than a gigabyte in terms of the baseline, and it's only about 120 megabytes in terms of this on-demand application. So which means that you could now store 10 of your violent first-person shooter games instead of one without having to upgrade your phone. So, okay, and then we compared it to this other approach of cloud gaming, which is that you have a, a thin client on your smartphone, and then there is a cloud server which is doing all the computation and streaming all the content into your smartphone. So what you see there is that the bandwidth requirement is much higher than uh, with this kind of a pre-caching approach. So what is the takeaway from this? The takeaway from this, I would say, is that if your device and your network can cooperate, then you can handle resource contention a lot better. You can make better use of the wireless resources, cellular network bandwidth, and you can handle the, the storage on your device also more efficiently. So this cooperation, you provide a kind of API through which the device and the network can cooperate, and that's the key takeaway from this slide. <coughs> Questions? Go ahead. So my question is related to two applications ago where you were uh, sending the alert that you were about to leave a cell and you were going to some catastrophe. So uh, that's an awesome application, but did you ever consider that I'm about to leave a cell but I'm going to my own Wi-Fi? Okay, for instance, I pre something, now I can take for a couple minutes of data that I have. Yes. So the question is, do I also care about which network I'm going to go to rather than which network am I leaving, right? And that we do. So the predictive part talks about which network are you leaving, which network are you going to, and what is the state of the network you're leaving, and what is the state of the network you're going to. And you can expand this out to have farther look ahead. In fact, we do have a look ahead of up to five minutes. So if you're in a car and you're going through multiple base stations, then you would be able to predict out which base stations you're going to go to and what is the network state at each of these. So how do you predict the network state on a private Wi-Fi connection? So on a private Wi-Fi, as long as the initial data gathering has included those base stations or those Wi-Fi's, then you would be able to do it. But if your training data has no information about them, then you would not. Question? Going back to Tango versus Dash, uh -huh. you use a Google over Dash. Does Dash assume perfect location as well? Or? No, Dash has nothing to do with location prediction because it's purely a react, it, it's a non adaptive approach. It says, this is my buffer, I'm going to keep my buffer filled at all times. So in case there is a degradation in connectivity, I can replay from the buffer. Is there consideration where the algorithm that decides? The congestion resides. It seems like in one case people value on the cell phone. The cell phone knows you know, where it's located and where it's uh, data requirements going to be. That would result in something different than if you had it centrally located at base station. Right, right. So where exactly the algorithm algorithm runs is somewhat orthogonal to our algorithm itself. For practical purposes, where we have run it for our experiments is on a proxy, which sits between the client device and the cellular network. 
if uh, a cellular provider really buys into the solution and wants to deploy it, they would do this at the base station. Okay? Because the base station has the necessary local network information, and it's already seen all of the device information. The base station has state about all the devices which are connected to the base station. <clears throat> All right, I have uh, maybe 15, maybe 10, 12 minutes. So I'll do a whirlwind tour through dependability in what are called bare metal IoT devices. IoT stands for what everybody knows by now, so I won't insult your intelligence by selling it out. But bare metal IoT stands for these low end devices which don't have an operating system on them. So it's one application image that runs on these devices. And they're actually all around us. So uh, if you have a smart lock in your hotel room, then that has typically a bare metal IoT device in it. Uh, hard disk controller that you have, which is controlling the hard disk, that has a small microcontroller, which is a bare metal device. It's not an IoT device, but it's bare metal. So these kinds of bare metal devices are around us doing sometimes state critical functionality. So, the, okay, I already defined this. Uh, important to keep in mind that their constraints are they have very small memory sizes and very small code sizes. One megabyte of flash, 128 kilobyte of RAM. And uh, they have tight constraints on how long it takes to run an application and how much power can be consumed on them. So this is how the current state of security is on bare metal IoT devices. So you have your RAM, you have your code, you have your IO peripherals, uh, pins, and then you have some security hardware which is trivially bypassable. So the security hardware may say, um, nobody can write to this code region. Once it's initially flashed, nobody can write any more code on it, which is a good thing because you don't want bad guys after your system is deployed to go in and be able to override any arbitrary code on it. So it seems like this hard security hardware is a good thing. But in the current state of practice, what happens is this entire code runs as a single root execution domain. So as long as you can find any vulnerability in this code, you can go in and turn off the security hardware. So it's like running all your, uh, your entire system all the time as root. And if there is even a single vulnerability in your code, then this can take over the whole device. So that's the current state of practice of security of this. So next time you go to a hotel and you have one of these electronic key cards, think of this. Whoever wrote that software, you, better, you hope that they did not have any vulnerability in their software. So why, why can't we take all of these defense mechanisms that we know from the server world or the desktop world and just use it here? <clears throat> so the first, there are several, not just engineering challenges, but conceptual challenges in there. The first is that there is no separation of privilege levels. So on your Linux operating system, there is a kernel software and there is a user level software. And there is a separation of privilege. And this, there isn't. There is a single binary image that runs on these devices. They lack a memory management unit, and a memory management unit can provide protection using this virtual, virtual addressing scheme. On these, there is no such scheme. Small memory sizes, which I already mentioned, and tight runtime constraints. So you cannot expand the running time by any significant length. So we came up with uh, the solution called the proxy. I think our greatest achievement was coming up with a name for it, uh, which made sort of sense and, and has this cool um, translation to say this can work across any hardware and for any software. So X hardware and Y software. So what this does is it protects against code injection attacks, control flow hijacking, data production attacks, and direct manipulation of I.O. So this direct manipulation of I.O. Is, is problematic because maybe your IoT device goes and sends a high value to pin number five. And when you set a high value to pin number five, that's when the door of your hotel room opens, right? So this protecting I.O. is important. And the fundamental primitive that this builds is what are called privilege overlays. So what privilege overlays does is in your entire code, it creates two privilege levels. So you find that 
99% of the time, your code does not have to do any security critical stuff. It's doing more uh, what you can execute as non group So the privilege overlay drops the privilege level for the code by default. Only when it needs to do the security sensitive operation does it elevate the privilege. And how do you determine what is security sensitive and what is not? And that's done through some fairly sophisticated static analysis. So that's, it. that's the basic idea behind this kind of a privilege overlay. You can read all the gory details in our security and privacy paper from this year. And the usability for this is very easy. So you have the source code. It does not need to be modified. The user provides what are the sensitive I.O. pins. Okay? Then we take our LL, uh, epoxy LLVM-based compiler, which compiles this and spits out the hardened application. So now you have this application, which is protected against all of these different kinds of attacks. So um, it can deal with a fairly sophisticated threat model, arbitrary memory corruption. And the attacker goals are to hijack the control flow of this application or to corrupt certain specific uh, global data locations. And what it needs is a, a protection unit, which is which we found to be standard even on low-end devices, called a memory protection unit. It's a hardware that enforces access permissions on physical memory. So what we have with this privilege escalation idea is, is this. So we identify that this part, which in, in this case, it is really a certain uh, pin, the value from a certain pin, UART pin in this case, that's the security sensitive operation. So what it does is it identifies that this is a security sensitive operation, and then everything runs as unprivileged. It only requests privilege here, it elevates the privilege in here, and as soon as that security critical operation is done, it drops the privilege. So that's it. And this is the after picture, whereby um, you have privileged execution for only very small parts of your code. And this is a performance evaluation. Um, this is with a whole set of 80 odd benchmarks, or deep benchmarks, uh, min average max in terms of running time. So uh, positive value means that it takes longer to run. Negative value means it takes actually shorter to run. So the counter, and these are, and this is the power. As I mentioned, these are the two big constraints. You want it to run as fast as possible and consume as little power as possible. And these are three actual fairly heavy duty applications that we wrote from the, that, that are there in the IoT space. Uh, percentage increase in runtime. So above zero means there is an increase. Below zero means there is a decrease. And percentage increase in energy. So of course, uh, the max value is somewhat disconcerting that it can be fairly high. Uh, the max value here can also be fairly high. So all it needs with all of our security tricks in place. However, some counterintuitive result is sometimes you actually get a speed up. So you get security and you get speed up. So whoever told you that there is no free lunch in the world is clearly wrong. You can get both in this case. Uh, if you're curious, maybe you're not curious, but if you're curious, you can read our paper why you sometimes have a speed up as well. Okay, just the final piece maybe is since security costs you some, you may decide, you may have to make a decision, should I secure my asset or should I not secure my asset? So let's say you are the manager of a large industrial control system, industrial plant, and you have thousands of assets in there. <laughs> these are all legacy assets. So you have to go in and implement these security mechanisms, and they will cost you in terms of running time and power. So you will have to make a decision which ones should you secure and not, and which ones not. And for the ones that you want to secure, you have to decide, should I invest $10 for the defense or $100 for its defense? So then we've taken that problem and applied uh, game theoretic techniques in order to come up with the solution of which ones should you secure and what should be your defense investment. So here, this is with three RTUs, with 30 RTUs. And there are three lines in here. One is the social optimum, which is that uh, a government comes, sits down, and makes this optimum decision across all the players in your system. Okay? Then you have a joint defense, which means that in this case, you have two players. Player one 
realizes that his well-being depends on some assets of player two and can invest in securing player two's assets. And then this is your selfish one, where each person only decides to, each player decides to secure only his assets. So of course, the social optimum is the best. But uh, the greater is the, the disbalance, asymmetry among the defense budgets of the different players, this one is that much better. So 10 means, so the total budget is 20. So this point means each player has the same defense budget. So it's symmetric. So in the symmetric case, you see that all the three lines converge. So take away from this is given a large scale set of assets with interdependencies among them, you can use certain rigorous mechanisms to decide where to invest and how much to invest. That's it in terms of our um, deep technical dive. So just concluding insights about dependability and data analytics, I would say is dependability involves handling both natural and malicious failures, and handling involves doing some prediction to prevent the bad thing happening. If the bad thing does happen, try to detect it as quickly as possible, try to contain the problem, and then try to repair it if you can. And dependability as it existed before was strict rule-based. If X happens, then take this uh, action Y. But in this age of unstructured data and lots of data, the such strict based rule systems, rule based systems don't seem to work very well. So you have to come up with fuzzier machine learning based techniques in order to figure out what's right, what's wrong, and what to do when something goes wrong. Uh, and different domains have different kinds of constraints and different kinds of opportunities that we provide. We discussed embedded and mobile networks and computational genomics rather fast. And final takeaway, seeing that there are lots of students amongst us here, uh, these are more philosophical takeaways, which I wish my advisor had told me day one. I learned some of them through hard knocks, and so I pass them on to, to people that I work with whenever I can. Um, so explore at the point of greatest curiosity. If you already know what the result of your experiment is going to be, it's not that much fun doing that experiment. But at the same time, beware of rabbit holes. You can easily go down, digging deeper and deeper and deeper into a problem which is finally not going to be worth its while. Uh, do not be intimidated by the volume of prior work. Uh, somebody comes in and puts a stack of 15 papers that have already been written in this problem. Don't immediately assume that this problem is all solved. Try to understand what are the simplifying assumptions that this prior work has made. Um, and question those assumptions. And I find that it's much better to try out a small, simple idea rather than sit and spend three months just reading prior. That can sometimes be rather frustrating. You feel all the good ideas in the world have already been invented. How can I ever get my PhD done? So try out your small ideas at a small scale. And learn from your own mistakes. Socialize your research, which means that discuss your ideas with your peers, not just in your immediate research group, but maybe with a broader group of graduate students. And I find time and time again, the students who are most successful in their graduate careers are the ones who are generous and in sharing their insights, and sharing their code, and sharing their data. You build this nice, nice ecosystem around you, and that, that will help you multiple fold now in grad school and down the road as well. That's it. If you want to read, uh, well, these are all my collaborators. It's been a great fun working with this good group of collaborators. And uh, that's it. If you need to hear more details, uh, see more details, the site deck is all available on our group page. Thank you.